Hey there and welcome back to another Birth Serenity podcast. Remember that you can also watch and listen to all our episodes on Facebook, IGTV or YouTube if you like the video format more. Or you can find the Birth Serenity podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please show us your love and support by liking this video, sharing it with your pregnant friends or just giving it a rating on the podcast platforms. This week I am very honored to have a very special guest on the show and she is Dr. Rachel Reed from Australia. She is a midwife, academic, author, presenter and a researcher and in all areas of her work she is committed to the promotion of physiological birth and of women's rights. Her research focuses on women's experiences of maternity care and with the aim of foregrounding women's needs and rights in the development of maternity services and practice. Her writings have been widely published in books, journals and magazines and her publications have been cited in midwifery textbooks and clinical guidelines. And she's also the author of the award-winning Midwife Thinking blog. This week we will talk about nuchal cords. So you may be wondering what exactly is a nuchal cord. A nuchal cord is defined as an umbilical cord that has become wrapped around the baby's neck. Culturally, nuchal cord is associated with danger and risk. But this just mongers unnecessary fear and disproportionate concerns for parents. Today, we will address the issues surrounding this common situation to educate parents and hopefully they can then make better choices regarding any possible interventions. My name is Carla Nivert and I am extremely passionate about pregnancy, birth and babies and helping you to find your way through and embrace both the messy and magical things on this extraordinary journey of bringing your precious baby into this world. I'm a small town mama who has taken a leap and become a certified birth educator and have a very deep desire to help as many mothers as I can around the world. I want you to feel ready, confident and excited to go into labor so you you can have your best chance at a smooth, calm and a beautiful natural birth. So please get comfy and ready to learn all you need to know to feel prepared and informed about your pregnancy, birth and easing into breastfeeding with confidence. We won't shy away from the real talk. This is the Birth Serenity Podcast. So hi Rachel, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So I guess before we dive into this week's episode, um, just tell me a little bit more about yourself and your work. Oh, goodness. Okay. So I am a midwife um, from England initially, and I am now over in Australia. So I practice midwifery in Australia and the UK under a range of models. So hospital settings, home birth. Um, I am an academic, so I'm a researcher. Um, what else am I? A writer, an author. So where I am currently is um, I work at a university primarily, um, coordinating a bachelor of midwifery program, and I write books in my spare time and have a podcast, <laughs> do all those things. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so today we talk about nuchal cords, and you have also studied your PhD in this? I started my PhD in this, yes, and then I kind of moved on to other things as part of the PhD process. But this was the topic, I guess, that really got me interested in wanting to know more and looking at the research. So how and why do babies end up wearing their cords around their neck? Hmm. Well, it's very common. Around about a third of babies will end pregnancy and have the cord around their neck at birth. So it's it's pretty common. And if you think about what happens in the uterus, there's a baby in there that's jumping about, and it's really normal for the baby to wrap the cord around them. Um, that's normal. So when it's around the neck, it's just around a different part of the baby. So it could be around the shoulders, it could be around the neck, it could be around the leg. It's very common for babies to get tangled up in their cords one way or another and the cords actually designed for that purpose which is why it's wrapped in Wharton's jelly so that 
it's protected from stretch and pulling and twisting and all the things that babies do to their cords. And during birth, the baby rotates through the pelvis. So if the cord wasn't already around the baby's neck, that's a very common time that it will wrap as the baby rotates and kind of wraps the cord around their neck as they go. So it's pretty common. And, you know, if you've got a baby that's moving about, it can happen. Can ultrasound scanning identify the presence of a nuchal cord? Um, yes, and unfortunately, that's happening. Um, and I know in certain parts of the world, that's then been used as an excuse to do a cesarean, which is a little bit worrying because they're going to find it quite often. The absence of it during pregnancy, if they don't see it on a scan during pregnancy, does not mean that it won't be present at birth. Am I right? So they can yeah. turn during labor. Yeah. Yes, because as the baby rotates through the pelvis, the cord will wrap around something because mm -hmm. that's how it works. And commonly in, in labor, it'll wrap around the baby's neck. And it's actually protected when it's around the neck because it's protected from the contractions squashing the cord. Whereas if it's, say, for example, over the shoulder, there's more chance of the cord getting squashed, which again is normal part of labor. So to some extent, wearing the cord around the neck is quite a sensible thing to do if you, if you think about protecting the cord. Yeah. Um, I saw on your blog that you referred to these uh, common excuses that care providers use to get mothers into having pre-labor cesareans. You refer to it as scapegoats, and I love that um, term because that really is what it is. Why do you think it is that nuchal cord has become such a perfect and versatile scapegoat? Because it's so common. So when you have a situation where you have complications or if you want to enact an intervention, then a third of the time you've got an, a, a nuchal cord to use as a scapegoat. So what you commonly see, and this is why I kind of got interested in it, was, you know, you'd have a, a you'd be caring for a woman in labor and there would be the baby getting distressed and then you'd go to theater and then there'd be you know, a baby would come out with the cord around their neck and the parents would be told, oh, it's a good job we did a cesarean. The baby was getting stressed because the cord is around the neck. Despite the fact that, you know, during that labor, the woman was having high rates of syntose non-infusion, which we absolutely know is the biggest risk for the baby in terms of distress. So we were doing all these other things to her. But once the baby's out, the cord was blamed. So I was just thinking, well, that's really interesting because at the same time, I'm seeing women give birth with baby's cords around their neck and the baby's in a really good condition and that's not blamed on the cord. So, you know, I had a, I had a baby with a cord around the neck before I was a midwife myself and, you know, she came out and she was fine and I didn't attribute that to the cord being around the neck. I didn't say my baby was born in good condition because the cord is around her neck. Yet, if we'd had a cesarean, that the cord around her neck may have been the scapegoat for the cesarean. So I just started to see the two things being put together, a complication and intervention with the fact there's a cord around the baby's neck and wondered, well, is, is that actually the case or does the cord happen to be there? Yeah, so it, um, it's a way for the care providers to lay blame on the mother and the baby. Yes. Um, yes, and not on themselves. And that's, pr that's okay. pretty common throughout maternity care. You always blame the mother and the baby rather than what you're doing to the mother and the baby. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've worked as a birth photographer for many years. And obviously, then you're just like a fly on the wall. So you don't say anything. You just um, document what's happening. And I've heard many doctors um, tell mothers afterwards that um, or they tell them that this now needs to be a cesarean so they're not progressing fast enough and then afterwards they say oh but the cord was too short and that's why the baby couldn't be born so they were basically saying that the baby was being held up by the cord um, so is this possible whether it is a nuchal cord around the baby's neck or not can the cord be too short to be born um that would be extremely rare because of how birth physiology works. And I think part of this is that we have very little understanding of birth physiology, which is why I recently went and worked out how to use an iPad to draw a diagram of what happens in labor and birth, because the textbooks don't depict it 
properly. So our common ideas and, you know, in the books and in the textbooks and what medical um, practitioners are taught is that you've kind of got this baby moving down with the bungee cord of, you know, of the umbilical cord. And that's not how it works, that the uterus gets smaller and smaller and the whole package, the baby cord and placenta all move down together. So it's not like the baby starts moving away from the cord and then gets, you know, stuck because it's not long enough. So that doesn't make sense. You could, in theory, if you had a baby that was really entangled in their cord, you know, multiple times. So this is not about a nuchal cord. This is just about a cord being really tied up. So the baby's a package. Then you might get a problem happening right at the end of birth when the when the baby then does need to descend past out of the uterus, so it needs a little bit of give in the cord to get the head out. But that would be pretty... I have seen babies very well packaged up. In fact, I saw a breech baby that was very well packaged up, which is probably why he was coming out breech, because he would not have been able to turn. He was, you know, he had the cord under his legs, around his knees. It was like, pretty good job. Um so he ended up being a breech birth because he couldn't turn himself around to come out head first. We came out bum first in a package. Okay. So babies are not bungee jumping. <laughs> they no. Things. Yeah, I love that, that way of explaining it. Um, can the nuchal cord strangle the baby right after birth? So you just said that obviously inside the womb, the baby's always safe um, because of that jelly that protects the the nuchal cord or during maybe the last bit of labor can the baby be strangled well okay so at the very end of labor the baby needs maybe an inch or so of give in the cord so that their head can be born to move out because if you think about as the baby's head's being born you've got the vagina making it's all it all becomes one thing it's not like a big tube it's actually around the baby's head so you just need a little bit of give for the cord um maybe an inch or so for the cord to kind of stretch or give so the baby's head can come out um so the baby's shoulders and everything can come out so this is after the head's born sometimes what happens is there isn't that give and you get the cord gets really pulled tight so all the vessels become tight Cords are pretty tough, they're, they're pretty strong, and they're actually coiled so they can be stretched. They're well designed to be stretched and to have pressure put on them. So in terms of, it doesn't strangle the baby, in ter- because the baby's not breathing. So, you know, when you strangle somebody, you stop them from breathing, the baby's not breathing. But what can happen is it can get really um, pulled tight. So the blood vessels in the cord get squished and there isn't blood flow through the cord during that last moment of birth, which can happen, you know, for other reasons. You could have a cord that's getting compressed further up. That So not having oxygen flowing through the cord to the baby at the end of birth is fairly common. And all that happens is that once the baby's born, the placenta starts that circulation again, sends the oxygen to the baby and the baby, you know, recirculates the oxygen and it's fine. You know, babies are actually have evolved to expect some stress in labor and birth in fact they're set up for that in the last moments before the woman goes into labor the last days and moments set the baby up for some stress and they actually need to be releasing cortisol which is stress at the end of labor in order to initiate a lot of changes in terms of breastfeeding behaviors and all of that good stuff you know initiating breathing so that is the worst case scenario and that's pretty rare for the cord to be so tight that it occludes itself I have very very rarely seen that happen because it's usually got enough give um, even if it is short and tight Mm -hmm. I've had Dr. Uh, Michelle Odon on one of my previous episodes and he said that we are you know most care providers and birth educators they're so focused on the baby needs all of these good hormones to be born but they actually really need those stress hormones as well yes yep Yep. Are there more dangers or things to worry about if the cord is wrapped more than once around the baby's neck? I've seen this on a group that the mother posted that the cord um, has been wrapped three times around the baby's neck and how her care provider is very worried and she really wants a natural birth, but um, that's not in the cards anymore. 
So is a nuchal cord that is wrapped more than once around the baby's neck more dangerous? Not necessarily, and I wouldn't really say cords around the neck are a significant danger. There's far worse places that an umbilical cord can be, and there's far more... There's other things that would be way more worrying than a cord around the neck. And they're often around more than once, you know, three times. I've seen it. Um, there's some great footage of it on YouTube. I'll have to find it again. Um, of a woman who's birthing in hospital and her baby's cord is around the neck five or six times. <laughs> and wow. luckily it's a long cord. So it's not really about how many times it's wrapped around. If it's wrapped around lots of times and it's short which is unlikely, then right at the end of labor, you're more likely to get that scenario where, you know, the cord gets tension on it because it's short and tight and that's the scenario. But that's more, that's not to do with how many times it's around the neck. That's to do with how much give is in the cord. And cords, you know, cords vary in length and they tend to be long enough. If you think about the length of an umbilical cord, it's usually long enough to get the baby while still attached to the placenta to the breast. That's kind of the, the usual length of a cord. So that's pretty long. So if you imagine wrapping that twice around a baby's neck, you've still got quite a lot of give in that cord. Can nuchal cords cause morbidity or even mortality during pregnancy? So this is before labor starts. Um, there isn't any evidence to show that. There is evidence that for some babies, the cord... This is really difficult because when a woman has a really bad outcome, like a stillbirth or something, parents want answers. And often we give answers even though they're not the answers. So in those scenarios, sometimes when the cords around the baby's neck, that will be given as the reason, even though there's no evidence that that is the actual reason. Or maybe reason. if there is a knot in the cord. Yeah, that is more likely... If you had a knot and it was pulled tight, then that is more likely to cause a problem. So cord accidents, as they're called, um, are often documented when there's a poor outcome. But they're not. But there's also good outcomes which aren't then associated with the cord. So I think again, this is the scapegoat thing of having to give an answer. And when a woman has a complication, finding an answer that isn't about what we're doing <laughs> is is kind of where we end up. What we end up doing. I saw a post on Instagram just yesterday of a cord that has a knot in and it's a really tight and a big knot and baby was perfect. Yes, and that's why it's best not to know. So the only cords, the only knots in cords that I have seen have been after perfectly healthy births and we've been checking the placenta and going, oh, look at that. <laughs> Good job we didn't know about that because we would have been scared, you know, mostly unnecessarily. Yeah. I want to ask you about pulling cords around baby's necks when they are being born. Is it a good idea to try and loop the cord off the baby's neck even before the baby is completely out? It's common practice in a lot of places to, once the baby's head's out, check for the cord and then pull the cord over the baby's head if it's there. That can be a problem in a number of ways. When you handle the cord, you can cause the cord to kind of spasm, which actually reduces the blood flow through the cord. The other, th the other risk of doing that is you can actually snap the cord. And I, put, I have done that myself as a um, student midwife, snapped the cord. And then you've got, you know, the baby's now not getting oxygenated by the placenta. You've got to quickly clamp the ends of the cord, otherwise the baby loses blood. So you're basically c causing a complication from something that's not complicated. So that's the looping the cord. And you don't need to. The baby will birth with the cord around their neck. It's not a problem. Um, if the cord's very, very tight, um, I have, it used to be, I hope it's completely gone out of practice now, but people used to clamp and cut the cord and then unwrap it. So what they were doing there was disconnecting the baby from their oxygen supply when just their head's out. And then if there's any delay in that baby being born, you've got a problem. And the baby hasn't got its full blood volume because the blood's now trapped in the placenta and it can't flow back to the baby. So that, again, is really not good practice. People have actually stopped doing that because there's been law cases suing practitioners for doing that. So that's when I first trained, that, that was pretty common. Um, and that seems to have stopped now, thankfully. Yeah, so in essence, it's best not to know that the cord's there and just let the baby be born and, and however they need to do that. 
Also for the mother, I think um, if only baby's head is out, maybe your contraction then stopped right there. Now you're still waiting for the shoulders to be born. And now there's this midwife or obstetrician sticking their fingers in there and trying to get the cord off the baby's neck. I don't think that'll be (laughs) a good or a nice experience. No, it's very painful. Women describe it as very painful. It's essentially a vaginal examination, but you're not getting consent to do it. Okay, so to summarize this, if a, a if a mother is told then by a care provider, okay, this now needs to be a cesarean, your baby's cord is wrapped around the neck, you can see it here on the scan. It, just to summarize everything, what would you tell those moms? It's probably best to not know the cords around the neck because that's a very common thing. That is not an indication for a, a cesarean under any guidelines or under any research. There is, there's not... <laughs> It's not a. It's not an issue, you know. And in in Denmark, um, they don't even have a thing about cords around babies' necks. They don't manage it at birth. Um, in my experience, which is pretty hands off in terms of how I practice, babies come out with cords around the neck all the time. Um, it's really not a problem. But what you need to consider is, and I, you know, write about this in my in my book, is when you're preparing for birth you need to kind of have an understanding of the map, which is where you're going to birth and who you're going to birth with. And if a care provider is saying that a cesarean section is indicated because there's a cord around the baby's neck, then that's an indication that this care provider is not comfortable with physiology and is comfortable with intervention and is prepared to not follow world guidelines around recommendations and reasons for a cesarean so I guess you need to have a little think about that and realistically if you were to then try and birth with somebody who's terrified of a cord around your baby's neck the chances are there'll be some reasoning during labor that you know that there's a problem Mm -hmm. even if there's not it's not progressing fast enough Mm mm-hmm Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's such an honor for me to speak to all of these big names in the industry. Um, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the work you're doing. It takes oh. lots of us doing it in lots of different directions to change this. Are you pregnant? Hoping for a smooth, calm, beautiful, natural birth? Let us help you with that. In the Birth Serenity Antenatal Program, we focus on natural birth and would be honored to help and support you to prepare yourself in the best possible way, both mentally and physically, for your birth. Our aim is to help you find peace and accept your birth whichever way it turns out. For more information, go to birthserenity.com.